Um, it's, a, it's a treat to be here, guys. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate that. And uh, Leora knows me. She's heard what I'm about to say before. So uh, Leora, thank you for backing us all up. Um, really appreciate that too. Um, actually, before I get into the three structural shifts, which I think are going to provide you with all a massive aha moment when it comes to job seeking and have a huge impact on your job seeking performance, um, I've got a couple of things I want to ask. Um, first of all, um, what's the number one thing that you're struggling with in your job search? Is it your CV? Is it LinkedIn? Is it interviews? Is it just getting found in the first place? Just fire that into the chat box. So that'll help me direct what I say in a in a in a um, in a way that's more relevant to you rather than just give you something you know you know that this pre-canned Let, let's see if we can't make it uh, relevant to you Carlos is saying age that's a huge one for senior executives everybody's got a bit of gray hair um, and they, that that's is perceived to count against you so we're going to cover that for sure Carlos um, overqualified and um, the, just getting an offer Lynn says so it sounds like you're getting as far as interview Lynn but just not getting it across the line uh, so just Load that up when finding openings, getting the interview, too many applicants, says Tom. Yeah, it's competitive marketplace, isn't it? Um, closing it out, there's another one that could just not, not getting it over the line. Um, so let's see if we can't have an impact on that because you can make things a lot easier for yourselves on that. Um, uh, finding opportunities, uh, relocation concerns, says James. Um, I'm not certain what that is, James, but we'll talk about that in a second. I'll drag you in and get you up on, on our digital stage. Um, Okay, cool. So uh, sounds like there's some common themes there, getting things over the line and also finding uh, opportunities along with a little bit of, you know, perhaps being overqualified or, or age being an issue. So we'll, we'll get into those. So thanks for that. Um, and I want to give you something right off the cuff, actually. Uh, by the way, there is no sales pitch coming. Everything I offer you is free. There's some links to some stuff that I'm going to provide, but they're all completely gratis. So um, help yourself to those in a minute. Uh, you're going to do some networking, I hear. Is that right, Jerry? That's right. Well, cool. we would, if, if not uh, today, but we would do structured networking uh, starting in November, following our speaker's presentation. What we do essentially is give uh, give our attendees an opportunity to spend uh, 30 to 60 seconds on their elevator pitch. Tell us, you know, companies that they're looking for, uh, positions that they're looking for, and it provides an opportunity for those in attendance to say, say, have you uh, heard about this opportunity uh, and or uh, uh, I know so and so at such and such. Uh, why don't you mention my name, give him a call and so on. I mean, that's that is the whole purpose of of uh, of our organization is so, to, provide, to provide that networking opportunity. Who would like the formula for an unbeatable elevator pitch? Should I do that for you <laughs> right now? Oh, we're getting a show of hands. Uh, yeah, lots, lots of people want that. Um, so um, uh, if you haven't heard of this guy, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about him and where, where this came from so you know why I consider it to be unbeatable. Uh, there's a man on the planet called Laszlo Bock. Uh, Laszlo used to be the former global head of HR at Google. And um, his problem was that Google's recruitment performance was no better than anybody else's, which kind of pissed him off a little bit because they're Google. It should, it should be, right? Um, and Google being Google only ever attracted A-list applicants. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a B-list player, you don't aspire to work at Google. You know you're never going to get the job. So with this incredibly high level of, or high quality talent applying for jobs at Google and Google being one of the best companies on the planet in 10 different ways, why wasn't their recruitment performance better than everybody else's? You know, why was it all a bit meh? So he did what Google do best and he treated the whole thing like a data exercise and chopped all the CVs and job descriptions up into their component parts, threw them into a data hopper, analyzed them, and then bless him, well, five, six years back now, published the results. Now I'm a freak for data. Um, I eat it up for breakfast. So I, I got my dessert spoon out and, and piled in. Um, now he helps out uh, hiring managers, so obviously he's the head of HR, uh, and I help out you guys as job seekers. So we had to reverse engineer that data, um, but it wasn't complicated. Um, and the message that came out of it, the analysis of that data was super, super clear. Uh, and it's this, everybody bangs on about themselves. Um, hello there, uh, I've, you know, I've got 25 years in finance, I'm an ACCA qualified person, I've got this, that, and the other. You know, it's all about them. Um, and what they yeah. fail to, to, to share with the hiring manager um, is what the benefit of all that stuff to the, would be to the hiring manager. You know, why it benefits them and how much it benefits them, you know, the quantity of that benefit. And so uh, he then crafted um, a formula for the hiring managers, um, and then we reverse engineered that. And I've created what's called the five P 
formula. All right, so you want to pay attention to this right now. This came come out of a truckload of Google data and is, in my personal opinion, unbeatable. Okay, so when you meet someone networking, um, out of your mouth should come a statement um, which has these five elements in it and nothing else. All right. And you'll be immediately qualified in or out as relevant for the remainder of the conversation. And if you're not, you can move on to the next person. If you are, there'll be a very compelling and relevant reason why you'll continue with that conversation, which is hugely helpful to you. All right. So um, first thing you need to understand is um, out of all the things you do in your job, what the benefit of them is. And there's only three things businesses do. They make money, reduce costs and mitigate the risk uh, in, in that business. And that's it. All right. So you're going to need a purpose. That's one of the P's. Yeah. What's the output of all you all the things you do? Um, in fact, what the heck? Let's because we spoke to, to Matt earlier. Matt, can you unmute yourself? Yay. Yes. OK. Let's let's play with some live ammo. Uh, Matt, what do you do for a living? Um, you CFO, I FBA, agree. What, 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 what do you do? Well, I mean, I'm a CFO. CFO, great. Um, and what's the benefit to your company of you being the CFA? Do, are you a commercial CFO? Do you typically drive revenues or you're helping to cut costs or you're mitigating some financial regulatory compliance risk? Or what, what, what's the big thrust of what you do? Well, it, it's it's a mixture of all, in, all of it. It's, yeah, it uh, will be, but there'll be one. Make sure that the company survives. Sure, sure. Um, but there'll be a bias where you spend perhaps more time than you spend on other things because, you know, you, you can task out compliance normally to somebody else. And... Yeah, well, uh, I guess in my in my prior life when I was a CFO, I, I was doing uh, a lot of uh, turnaround. So that would be cost cutting and, and uh, making sure everything works. Fine. So cost cutting. Um, cutting the fat from the business. Fine, that's, that's a useful thing, uh, particularly if businesses are running a bit fat, um, you need to you know, cut that out and make them leaner. Um, and what typically was the amount of money that you were able to cut from a business? What's, what level do you operate at? Are you trimming a million quid off or 10 million or 100 million? Give me well, a sort of sense of context. more like uh, 10, 10 to 15%. Um, of yeah, but what, of what, 100 bucks or 100 million bucks? Give me a sense of scale. Um, it was about a 100 million company. Okay, um, and so you're you're trimming around ten million quid off, yeah, 10 to 20 million quid, something like that. Yep. Yeah, ten percent, ten percent of a hundred million pound business, right? So your purpose is to help reduce costs. Um, the performance, um, which is the second P we're talking about, or the five P formula, um, which is just the quantity of that benefit, um, turns out to be um, ten million quid on a one hundred million pound business, plus or minus. Yeah, we can refine the numbers if we get into this in a longer conversation. And you do that by leading the finance function effectively as a CFO. Yeah, that's how you do it, which is also called process, which is the third B. So we've got purpose, which is um, reducing costs, performance, 10 million quid on a 100 million pound business, 10%, and process by leading the finance function effectively as a CFO. So we now need the first two Ps, which is person and place. Who do you do it for and where? Um, I'm almost certain that as a CFO, you'll be doing that for the CEO, yeah, because that's who you report into, yeah? So then the question is, where does this CEO hang out? So what kind of businesses do you typically do this for? And you can specify that by geography or scale or industry vertical or by culture. What, what sort of, you know, how do, you, how do we know what kind of business is, is a perfect fit for you? Uh, well, that would be manufacturing and distribution. So. Manufacturing and distribution, any particular location? FM, uh, FMCG, uh, Southeast Asia. Okay, fine. So um, you help the person, which is the first P, at a place, which is the second P, achieve a purpose, which is the third P, as measured by performance, which is the fourth P, by doing a process. That's the fifth P. That's your formula. Okay. Uh, and the order in which you work that out is purpose, performance, place, and then you do person and, and um, uh, sorry, purpose, performance, process, then you do purpose and place. That's the, that's the order in which you work it out. And you end up with this statement. Uh, I help the CEOs of $100 million uh, Southeast Asia manufacturing and distribution businesses uh, reduce their costs by up to $10 million uh, by leading the uh, CFO function effectively. Lovely to meet you, Matt. What do you do? Oh, I help CEOs of uh, Southeast Asian manufacturing businesses around 100 million quid um, uh, reduce their costs, uh, typically around 10 million uh, by leading their CFO function properly. Oh, do you now? That's interesting. 
because I know what's in it for me, reduction in costs. I know how much is in it for me, 10 million bucks. I also know whether or not that is me. Am I the CEO of a Southeast Asian manufacturing business or not? Because if I'm not, or I don't have a cost problem, or my cost problem isn't plus or minus 10 million bucks, it's either a, you know, 1 million where you're overqualified or 100 million where you haven't reached up to yet. You know, that 5P formula is unbeatable, okay? And the minute you get used to saying that, which is um, who's it for, where are they, what's in it for them, how much is it for them, the first four Ps, you immediately attract those people to you. You stick that on your banner of your LinkedIn profile, you stick it in your headline, you stick it in your get to summary of your CV and make sure that comes out of your mouth when you are introducing yourself to anybody. Hello there, Matt, what do you do? Oh, I, I help CEOs of uh, manufacturing and distribution businesses in Southeast Asia, typically around 100 million quid's worth, uh, reduce their cost by about 10 million quid because um, I lead the CFO function properly. Oh dear. It's, it's got relevancy and it's all about the buyer. Yeah, So we'll talk about that in a second, but there you go, that's the 5P formula. So you might want to just, Replay that all to your sales and see if you can use that to punch up your elevator pitch when it comes to your networking sessions uh, in a week or so's time. Yeah, or in a month or so's time. Right. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you for being my glamorous assistant, Matt. We can get off the stage now. Um, <laughs> I'll mute myself now. Yeah. Um, right. Let, let's get on to the main topic then. Um, there have been some structural shifts in the job seeking marketplace over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, and they've accelerated because of the pandemic. And I want to explain them to you now. I'm going to provide you with a bit of a, yeah, like I said earlier, an aha moment. So I want you to pay attention to these. Um, I want to take you on a bit of a story about how things used to be. So you all recognize the landscape that you used to be in. And then I'm going to compare them with how they are today. And you can recognize that it is different. All right. And then we'll look at those differences and see how you can leverage them so you can utterly dominate your job search, which is what I do for a living. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Johnny Walker. I run a program called the Executive Edge, and it only has one purpose, one objective. It's a single line long, and it helps executive job seekers, people like you, get their ideal job, not just any old job, but the thing that they, you know, is in their sweet spot, um, faster and for more money uh, without you having to sell yourself. Because you're senior people, you shouldn't have to get the, the, you know, the begging bowl out, right? It's all a bit icky. So that's what I do for a living, um, and I am super, super good at it. Uh, and the program I run is 100% money back guaranteed. Hundreds and hundreds of executives have been through that program. Nobody who's completed the whole program has ever even asked for their money back. Um, and we have zero uh, refunds just because you know, we're very good at what we do. I've been around the market for a long time. I was 15 years in executive search. I've always only ever handled the careers of six-figure earners. Um, I also spent five years being mentored by one of the best digital marketers on the planet. And I've smashed those two disciplines together to create this program, which has been road tested for years now. So you're in pretty safe hands. Um, most of you, I'm looking around here on the Zoom call, so I can see you, uh, are like me. Uh, you, we are, what's the polite way of putting this? Ladies and gentlemen of a certain age, all right? Uh, a little bit of gray hair. And uh, we're the last generation to grow up without the internet. Yeah, we can all tell a tale of when there was no online. When if we wanted to buy something, we'd have to go down to the shops because that's all there was, yeah? Um, there wasn't an online alternative. And we didn't have enough information about what we wanted to buy. So we'd go inside to the shop uh, and we'd speak to a sales assistant. And however benign and professional that process was, it was a sales process. Now we were there talking to them, getting the information that we needed about whatever it was we wanted to buy. And at the end of that process, they'd try and sell us something, which is kind of what we went in there for anyway. So no big deal. However, Zoom forward to where we are now, particularly post-pandemic, post -pandemic, and we're 21st century, uh, post-internet era and all that, if you and I want to browse for stuff that we don't have full information on, why don't we slap down to the shopping mall, do we? No, we just jump straight online. And that's because all of the information that was previously exclusive to the salesperson, who we were dependent on um, in order to be able to make our decision, that's now all been transferred to the internet where we can access it for ourselves. So we don't need a salesperson anymore, do we? You know, whatever it was we were buying, and we can just pick on some examples, but it's pretty much everything, um, TVs or holidays or whatever. Yeah, How heavy a TV can you hang on a US internal wall, right? You can just get an answer to that from Google. There's no problem there, yeah? What's the difference between LED and LCD? Kind of thing you might have asked a sales assistant. Now you can just download a PDF on it, get it sent to your mailbox, all right? Stick your email address in and they'll email it to you, yeah? If it was holidays, the thing that bothers me is, you know, what's the sunny side of the hotel for my evening gin and tonic? You, know you can get all that stuff from customer reviews. You don't, you don't need a salesperson to start making decisions, all right? So let's just start with stick with TVs for a minute, and then I'm going to apply everything we're talking about to job seeking. Um, but it's really important 
that you understand these structural shifts, okay? So let's say you've tooled around the internet, you found a TV you like, it's got all the functionality you're looking for, great. Um, you've now got to decide where you're gonna buy it from. And that's when those marketing messages come into play. You know, you get those adverts down the side of the screen. Maybe you're getting them in your inbox as well if you've given up your email address for it, that PDF. Um, and they're gonna have differentiators. Uh, so one of them might say, uh, click and collect, watch the big game this afternoon. You know, if, that, if that's what you want, yeah, um, then you're going to pop down to the kind of shop that's basically got a massive warehouse attached to the back of it. It's a small, short storefront, and you're going to pop in there. Um, you might even be able to pre-order it and just go and collect the thing, and you literally put it in your car and take it away that day, all right? Or it might say additional warranty, you know, two years warranty instead of the standard 12 months. Fine. If that's more important to you, then you might go and get it from that kind of store. Um, it might say um, exclusive model to us. Actually, it is the exact TV you want. All they've done is change the plastic trim around the screen. So technically speaking, it's exclusive, but it's the same thing. Plus, they'll deliver it in a big branded truck. Park the truck outside your house where all the neighbors can see while they spend all morning installing the TV for you. Uh, it turns out you're a crashing middle class snob. I'm not here to judge you. Um, but uh, so now you've decided not just what you want to buy but also where you're going to get it from. And depending on what you're actually shopping for, because it might not be a TV or a holiday, it could be anything, you can ping your credit card details into the screen and it turns up in the post. Now, does everybody recognize that shift that you know it used to be a sales process because it was in person and now it's a buying process because you're online, yeah? yeah? Uh, the point of telling you that story is this. At no stage during the entire transaction did a salesperson even know you existed, all right? They had no idea you're online, no idea you were looking. In fact, um, they had no idea you were about to buy something and they had absolutely no ability to influence that transaction whatsoever. They didn't even know you existed, all right? In fact, it's no longer a sales process and it's no longer a sales world. It's a buying process and it's a buyer's world. Now, I wanna apply all this to job seeking, which is what you wanna learn about today, all right? Um, but I wanted you to know where that came from so that when I say these next three things, um, it's rooted in a strategy that the world has moved on um, and, and it's a buyer's world nowadays, okay? So the first thing is this, the hiring manager, they're the buyer in our story, in our little parallel here. Um, they're the one with the need. They're the one that's going to go looking, okay? You are selling yourself. Hi, I'm great. Here's my CV. Possibly you've got a recruiter doing that on your behalf too, yeah? The hiring manager is not used to having to run the gauntlet of a sales pitch anymore. They just don't do that. If they're in the mood to buy, they'll buy. And until then, stop hassling them with your bloody cover emails. Hi, I'm great, CV's attached. You know, it's just clogging up their inbox with something they didn't ask for, don't want, and is a waste of their time, right? And therefore a waste of your time, right? There is a process at play, and the process at play is a buying process. And unless you're allowing the hiring manager to engage in a buying process, which is what they do for everything else, including TVs and holidays, you too, by the way, and when you're in the hiring manager's chair, which often you've been in the past, all right? Um, if you're not presenting a buying process for the hiring manager to engage with, then you're kind of swimming against the tide, and that is hard work and counterproductive to you, all right? You've got to allow the buying process to take place because that's what the hiring manager wants to do, all right? Give them something they want to do. Position yourself to be part of a buying process. That's the first thing. I think most of you, are still in soft sales mode, you know? You're, you're marketing yourself, you know, sending your CV off with an email, extolling your virtues, you're pushing yourself in networking conversations. It's all sales, sales, it's outbound. You know, if you can get them to come to you by allowing them to buy you, you're gonna win. And I'll explain more about that in a second. Secondly, super big one this, if I was the hiring manager, I don't even have to advertise the vacancy, all right? Hiring managers can start their buying process up without declaring the vacancy at all, all right? Uh, they could look online, they could look on a CV board, they could look on LinkedIn, they could speak with their network offline, uh, asking who they recommend, and they could do all that without you even knowing they had a vacancy, all right? Then they get to see several candidates, and if they like one of them, they'll hire them. And then they announce to the world that they've made a hire, and you're like, what do you mean you've hired someone? I, I didn't even know you had a vacancy. What the hell's going on there? I'll tell you what's going on there. It's called the hidden jobs market. It's not hidden, all right? No one snuck it off and hid it in the cupboard anywhere. That's a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's proper name. Um, it's not as sexy, but it's, it's the accurate name. It's the unadvertised jobs market. Uh, and for those of you who are very senior, you'll be very familiar with this. Um, less than half of all of the vacancies in your marketplace are actually advertised. 
And if you're very senior, C-suite territory, uh, I suspect that that number is perhaps nearer, you know, 75, 80, 90 percent of jobs are not advertised. Virtually no CEO vacancies are advertised anymore. All right. So that buying process that the hiring manager is undertaking is behind a screen. You can't see it happen. Right. You didn't know that there was a vacancy there to sell yourself to. Uh, and if that's the majority of your market, anywhere between 50 and 95 percent of your market, right? If you want access to those vacancies, it's not going to be through a sales pitch, right? You can't sell yourself to something you can't see, right? You've got to allow yourself to be bought by the hiring manager, because only that way can you dramatically increase the size of the market that you're accessing. Because if you're in permanent sales mode, not only is it the wrong process for the hiring manager, but it's actually restricting yourself to selling yourself to things you can see, which is what, less than half the market, which is not very helpful to you. All right. That's the second structural shift that, you know, that this, this hidden jobs market everyone bangs on about is like, you know, how do I get access to those hidden jobs? You can't, right? But they can access you. So you've got to make yourself accessible. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and the third thing, um, which is underpins the quality of everything, is a thing called buyer seller integrity. And you'll recognize this, but it's hard coded into buying nowadays. Um, so this is super huge. So really pay attention to this. If you're involved in a transaction and there is a salesperson involved as well, if the salesperson thinks that what they've got matches your needs, what, 75% or better, then they might take a swing at selling it to you, right? Because that's what they do for a living. They're a, they're a professional salesperson. That's how they make their money, right? Um, however, if you remove the salesperson from the equation, as is the case online, where the salesperson didn't even know you existed, and remember we talked about that with TVs and holidays, yeah, where they had absolutely no uh, influence over their transaction whatsoever, actually buyers yeah, don't get excited by a 75% match. I'm like, yeah, it kind of does what I'm after, but it's not exactly what I want, I'll keep looking. Actually buyers get excited near a 95%, and that's when you get that sort of ooh sound, like, ooh, that's exactly what I'm looking for, how much is that? Um, and as soon as someone starts asking those kinds of questions about you know, price, then you know that you've got a potential buyer. Um, uh, and that's actually just called the, 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 the buying conversation. You know, the buying conversation comes to the surface. Um, and, and that's interesting. There's a disconnect between those two numbers, isn't there? 75% when salespeople are leading the transaction, but a 95% match to needs, yeah, a much higher quality result when buyers are leading the transaction. And that's explained very, very simply. Right, salespeople are burdened with the responsibility of making money out of transactions. So, of course, they want to lower the bar as much as they possibly can. I mean, without being ridiculous, if someone tried to sell you something that was only a 50% match to your needs, you'd just laugh at them. But at a 75% match to needs, some customers do open their wallet, and that's when sales kicks up the gear. However, on the buying side, yeah, you and me, when we're buying things, and when the hiring manager is trying to buy someone, um, we're not trying to make money out of that transaction, right? Actually, what we're trying to do is solve a problem. And so actually, conversely, we want the bar to be set as high as possible, yeah? And again, uh, without being ridiculous, I think if you said, yeah, I'm not spending any money unless it's 100% perfect, you know what, that solution probably doesn't exist. But at a 95% match to your needs, yeah, there's a reasonable expectation that there's a solution out there that, that matches that. So that's what you go looking for. And so the corollary to those is, is, is if you want your ideal job and you want it faster, then you must present a buying process as that's the process the hiring manager is using right now for pretty much everything in life. Also, when you present a buying process, um, you unlock all of the unadvertised jobs market. And that's where a greater quantity of vacancies are. And, and this is really, really important, when the buyer buys, yeah, when the buyer buys, they are more discerning than when a seller sells. So if you can position yourself properly um, and get found by a buyer and allow them to buy you, then they're only going to contact you if they perceive you to be a 95% match to the role anyway. And that's when your interviews get a whole lot more interesting and quite frankly, a lot easier. All right. Because right now you're online, you're looking at a vacancy and you think, wow, Johnny, I can do 75% of that. I'll give it a go. I'm a talented person. I'll work, work out the rest. And off goes your CV. I'm great. Hire me. You know what? Buyers aren't interested in a 75% match to needs. Yeah, kind of what they're looking for. You're not exactly what they want, though. They'll keep looking. You're not going to get an interview. You're not even going to get a look in. All right. So stop selling yourself. It's the wrong process. It's a smaller market and it's a mismatch. And instead, Allow yourself to be bought. It's the right process, a much bigger market. And when the buyer is buying you, they set the bar higher for you to be um, uh, to, to be bought. Yeah. So 
uh, you, you get into a much nicer interview. So, um, so how do you do all that then? You're like, fine, John, if I stop selling myself and I don't know how to get bored, then basically we're all in trouble. Uh, and, you, and you're right, you are. Uh, so how do you get bought? At a very high level, right, getting bought only breaks down into two areas. All right, so this is super easy. First of all, you've got to be visible, right? Can't buy you if I can't find you. So you've got to be uh, the tall poppy in the field is what we call it in the UK, that you know, the, 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 you've got to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and the other thing you've got to be is compelling, right? Because you're not personally going to be present to influence a hiring manager's perception of you with some kind of sales pitch, right? The hiring manager might be looking at your LinkedIn profile. You wouldn't know that. They might be looking at your CV that was given to them. You might not know that. They might be speaking to their network offline about who they recommend. You wouldn't know that. You're not going to be present for any of it. So your marketing or your messaging, for want of a better phrase, has got to do all the heavy lifting. And you've had a tiny little insight into how powerful the messaging can be for that 5P formula I gave you earlier, all right? You've got to be compelling when you're found and you've got to be very visible in order to get found. And then you say, okay, fine, how do you do that? Um, and actually there is a seven step um, system for that, a process, all right? Uh, for anybody who's a, a serious earner, an executive, senior person, particularly six figures and above, you can literally follow that seven step process and guarantee yourself a win. In fact, we do guarantee it. All right. Um, now, I'm not going to bore you to death with the rest of the program and all seven steps. Um, any questions, any thoughts, um, any, you know, anything? I'm here, I'm here to answer your questions, right? But there you go. Do you really find out of value, by the way, those, those three steps? Do you think, oh my God, uh, that's, that's a thing? Or do you think, yeah, no, we've heard all that before. It's rubbish. You know, just give me some feedback on whether or not I've, I've helped because some of the questions I got earlier, um, Carlos, I'm going to come to age in a minute. Um, but John uh, finding openings and Tom getting the interview um, and uh, Harlan finding opportunities. Um, th those things all get fixed. If you make yourself very visible and compelling to a hiring manager, they'll find you. So you haven't got to go look for the opportunity. In fact, you'll probably get found for an opportunity that wasn't even advertised. You'd never find it. All right. So that's going to fix that. And if you get found for an opportunity that's a 95% match to your needs, because the buyer's fussier than you are, then your interview is going to be an awful lot easier to close out. Yeah. So that's going to solve some of those problems straight off the bat. Um, age, uh, Carlos, I think it was Carlos, wasn't it? Yeah, Carlos, um, and overqualified. Um, it, again, if you make yourself visible for who you are, um, including your grey hair and your wisdom, or even, you know, it could be just something else, your skin colour, your gender, uh, your sexuality. If you're visible for those things, anybody who's um, bigoted about those things, um, they're going to give you a swear. They're just, they're just not going to interview you. That's fine. You don't need those people in your life in the first place. All right. You do not need to be turning up for an interview and for them to then roll their eyes because, you know, they don't like the look of you for some reason or another, you know? Oh God, I thought you were about 15 years younger. Oh no, we don't have another oldie in the office. You're like, what the fuck did I turn up for? What a colossal waste of my time. You know, whereas if you're visible for who you are in all of your glory, whatever that is, you know, female, grade head, you talk about your same sex partner, I don't give a shit. But those people for whom that's a problem, they'll just never speak to you. But everybody else who calls you in for an interview, they've got past that already. Before you've even met them, they're like, yeah, well, I know that about you. I knew you had grey hair. I saw you on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I moved on. You know, for me, it's a non-issue. And for that, so you can fix those problems by setting the agenda. You know, if you're, you know, if you're Matt, for example, you know, um, you know uh, I help the CEOs um, of Southeast Asian uh, manufacturing and distribution companies of around $100 million, save costs by 10 million quid by leading their CFO function effectively. If, if Matt was saying that on the video on LinkedIn, which is only going to take about 60 seconds to do, and I saw Matt, you know, and he was 112 years old and gray hair and, you know, colossal wrinkles, um, I'm going to have one or two responses, which is, I don't care. That guy seems he can really help us out. And I, you know, quite, you can have a thousand wrinkles. He can save us $10 million and I'm going to pay the guy, or I'm going to go, oh, too old. And I'm never going to bother Matt. Either way around, that's a win for Matt. All right? So you can filter out all the knuckleheads from your life by just being very visible. Yeah. Um, Carlos so says, Johnny, yeah. Johnny, one of the things you hear is that uh, in order to uh, uh, increase your visibility, hmm. uh, you should uh, write, maybe blog, uh, et cetera. But uh, the question then becomes, how do you know that what you're writing and blogging about is going to be read by that person that you're trying to reach yeah um we do it on the program i run um when we optimize people's linkedin presence one of the three things we do including 
uh, the subject you're talking about next week or next month rather is the SEO of your profile to make sure you've got the right keywords in there so you pop up in searches. There's quite a lot more to it than just SEO. Um, uh, but anyway, you've got to pop up in searches. Uh, you also got to grow your network. But the third thing is this, about once a week, um, you, you normally uh, do a, a piece of content. Yeah, uh, Normally a short post or a short video doesn't really being reached. You're going to get feedback underneath the post on LinkedIn that how many people liked it, um, how many people gave it a comment, and also how many views. Views are less important, but the comments are the thing that's really um, important. Because if you get a comment, you can reply to the comment. And the more you get a conversation going in the comments section, the more the algorithm thinks that that post must be interesting because it's getting you know, people's engagement and therefore it will give it more distribution to a wider audience. So when you do a post on LinkedIn, and I'm a LinkedIn nerd, so bear with me, I'm gonna give you some really technical details now. Um, what happens when you per first put a post out is it goes out to 10% of your first level connections. And then the algorithm watches the performance of the post. And if it tanks, then it's not gonna get any further distribution. But if it gets engagement underneath, because you asked an interesting question, you invited people to respond. That's why when you're on LinkedIn, you see those very lame posts that end with agree, question mark. They're provoking you to respond in the comments, you know. And, um, uh, and so you, 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 can, you can provoke people to respond. And for you, what you're looking for is, is, is a relevant audience. Um, uh, and so growing your network, so your 10% initial seed Distribution it gets bigger and bigger because 10% of a bigger number. So growing your network is important. Um, but also you can direct that um, uh, even more relevant with the use of hashtags. So, you know, you put, might put hashtag CFO, hashtag finance, hashtag Asia or something if you're mad, and just get an audience that's interested in those subjects. And there's all sorts of things you can do to um, just give the algorithm a bit of a steer on where you want it to go. All right. But it, it's, it's not about giving information away. All right, it's about starting a conversation. Most people don't understand that about um, all social media platforms is the algorithm is watching. You've got to give it something to learn from. So you've got to get a conversation going, all right? You've got to be a conversation starter, all right? And so being relevant, being consistent, and getting that conversation going is, is how you win. And we, we show you all how to do that on the program. It's, it's actually not that complex and, and also not that onerous. You don't have to do very much. Um, uh, and, and the way you win mostly um, is, is with video, just because um, uh, it, people engage with videos in the sense that the algorithm is watching how long it takes someone to consume someone's content. Um, I can look at a text post in about three seconds and move on, whereas I'll con it takes me longer to watch a video and then decide whether to continue to watch it. So my view time, what LinkedIn called dwell time, how long I linger over a post, goes up when I'm consuming PDFs and videos. So they're quite a popular thing. Also polls take people time to engage with. Those things tend to be quite popular as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, content is a, always a moving subject because it depends on how they've rejigged the algorithm to, um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to respond to market conditions. So there's no, there's no static answer to that. But right now it's about how long does it take someone to consume your post and do they engage with it by commenting? And those two things will give you greater distribution and, um, uh, you know, we, we, we teach you how to do all those things on the program. All right. Um, right. Uh, Carlos, does uh, the third structural shift mean headhunters may be becoming obsolete? Not necessarily, Carlos. Um, if I'm a hiring manager and I want to find someone um, for a, a hidden vacancy, I may not personally do the search. All right. My HR team may not personally do that. We might staff that out to an external agency. All right, so someone's going to be responsible for the process internally or externally. Um, so no, the, the process doesn't mean that it'll only be internal. Um, Carlos also says, what should someone who has had a very diverse set of experience and skills handle his visibility quickly? Well, yes, Carlos. Um, on the program, we thought we talked about positioning. Uh, what happens if you're a senior executive um, like Carlos, uh, and this is most of you, and you've got more than one string to your bow? Yeah, you've got more than one capability, which is almost certain for all of you very senior types. Yeah, you've been around the block a few times, you've picked up quite a few skills, and that's great if you're selling yourself, but if you're marketing yourself and you don't know what the problem is that someone's looking um, for, uh, looking for a solution for, then um, just emptying the kit bag of capabilities on the table and go, there you go, there's everything, rummage amongst that and decide, for, no one's gonna do it, right? You know, you can't just puke your entire career up and ask someone to wade through it and, and pick something, all right? So you do have to specialize, but there is a way 
of narrowing your message, not you, because you still have that broad capability and you almost certainly use it all in your job. You know, you've been in the job for a year and then someone says, oh, we're going to do a project in this area that wasn't related to why we hired you. You've got any experience in that space? You're like, yeah, loads. Oh, great. Can you help join this project team? Yeah, sure. And your job will expand anyway. I mean, that's going to happen. So we're not narrowing you, but your message needs to be narrower. All right. And there's a process for working out how to do that in an optimal way. Right, because as a hiring manager, and this will be all you too when you're a hiring manager, right? You don't wake up in the morning and think, do you know what? I'm going to spend myself six figures on hiring someone who's a jack of all trades. You know what I want? I want someone who's really expensive and a, you know, and can do a bunch of different things, nothing in particular. Said no hiring manager ever. All right. That morning they woke up with a problem that was giving them a headache and they went looking for a solution to that and nothing else. So the message that's quite narrow and specific will be found by them much faster. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, so, yeah. So that's Carlos. Uh, any other questions, guys? So perhaps you could tease us with uh, maybe a few of the seven uh, seven steps that you referred to earlier. Sure. Happy to. Um, the first thing, um, and, and, and this isn't going to sound like rocket science, and that's because it isn't. Um, but it's the implementation of it. It's where all the detail is that, that, that eludes people. So step one, I'll give you all seven, all right? Step one is, what is your ideal job, really? Yeah. I mean, if you're Carlos or anyone senior, you've got a bunch of capabilities there. How, you know, which one you want to specialize in? So how do you work out what that is? And then secondly, how do you articulate that in a compelling way? Um, which so that's step two. So that's positioning is step one. What's my ideal job? Messaging is step two. How do I say that really well? And we, we, we gave you a very little insight into that with um, uh, a very quick insight into that with the 5P formula from Google. Uh, step three is where do I put that message so that it's seen by the hiring manager, which we call distribution. So you've got positioning, you've got messaging, and then you've got distribution. The distribution just means, so where do I stick this new nifty message that I've got my elevator pitch so that it's actually seen by the hiring manager? And there are four big channels for that, all right? Um, your CV is one, because that might be on a CV board. Most of you are too senior to be hired via a CV board, but we pay attention to them anyway. Uh, LinkedIn is another one. Um, it's been really coming to its own in the last 18 months, LinkedIn. Um, recruiters, um, uh, Carlos touched on them earlier. They're, they're, they're going to play a part. Um, but the big one, the biggest channel to market for all of you guys is your personal network, the people who actually know you, as opposed to your digital network where you're connected to them, but you've never actually met. Your personal network may well be still at the water cooler or in an elevator with somebody and hearing about a problem going, oh, yeah, hold a second. Uh, I, I, a mate of mine, Carlos, does that. Um, so your personal networks are going to help because if I'm a hiring manager and I'm going to spend a lot of money on someone, my first point of call is always my network because I would like that decision to be de-risked. All right. I'm not hiring $25,000 worth of you know, data entry here. OK, where if I screw that up, we just get another one. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm spending $150,000, $200,000 on a CFO. Getting that wrong has got quite serious consequences for me. And so de-risking that decision by getting a recommendation is the first place I go. So your personal network is huge. And there's a way of getting that to, to uh, be optimal for you. So positioning, messaging, distribution times four. Um, the next step we do is a thing called choose your next boss, which blows everyone away. Um, right now, um, most of you, if not all of you, are not doing this but we will show you how to actually name your next boss before they even know you exist, all right? Uh, we know that at any given point in time, depending on how senior you are, depending on what market you're in or et cetera, somewhere between 5% and 15% of your target market is trying to find someone like you right now, okay? If you're the CEO, it'll be near a 5%. If you're the VP of something, it'd be near a 15%, yeah? And there are some other variables in there in terms of the type of job and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, but somewhere between 5 and 15%. So if you picked on 20 companies that you really want to work for because they're local to you or they're the kind of sort of, I don't know, culture, you know, they're fast growth or whatever it is that appeals to you, it's your criteria, completely, completely subjective. You pick on 20 firms. I'll show you how to name the individual at that firm who's responsible for the problem you solve. And then I'll show you how to get on their radar so that the 5 to 15% of those 20, 1 to 3, of them um, can start their buying journey up and buy you. So you'll end up in an interview for not just what you, what you want to do, but also at a place you really want to do it, which is when things get dramatically improved. All right. No longer. In fact, we pretty much ban you from tooling around the Internet, applying for any vacancy that moves. All right. You don't know who these firms are. 
They've just got the right sounding job title, the right kind of money, and you'll give it a go. This is no good, all right? You're six figure earners, a lot of you. What the hell are you doing working 10 hours a day at a job that you'd leave in a heartbeat for another job a bit like it down the road? All right, go somewhere that you know you love to be at. All right, so we'll fix that for you. So um, positioning, messaging, distribution, choose your next boss. Once all that happens, um, sure as eggs is eggs, um, you're going to wind up in an interview. All right. Um, and so that's step five, the interview. How do you nail that? There are loads and hints and tips on Google around interviews. I'm not going to give you any of those. That's too basic. All right. Uh, what we have is a very structured process um, around a thing called the buyer's journey, which I'm not going to get into right now, but it's a psychological journey that all buyers, including you and me, go on when we buy things. Um, we're also going to give you uh, some language for the interview um, so you can give them the right answers. Um, and we're going to get them to the end where they want to hire you. All right. So you don't even have to say, you know, you're not pitching yourself. You know, they're actually going to want to hire you, um, which means you're going to end up in the next conversation, which is about negotiation. All right. And that's where everybody makes tons of money. Uh, the most amount of money I've ever got someone extra on their pay was a lady who was a uh, FTSE 250, which is kind of equivalent to the Fortune 500 uh, lawyer. So general counsel. Uh, she was on 350,000 sterling, which is about 420 in dollars, maybe a bit more nowadays, 450. Um, she took a 110,000 pound pay rise despite being out of work for six months. It's about $150,000. Now, she was already on 350, so, you know, horses for courses. T typically, you know, people take uh, a, a minimum of, of, of 10,000 extra, and, and often it's 20, 30, 40, 50,000, depending on the level they're at. Um, and that negotiation script that we use is gold, and I uh, used a, a, a very heavyweight copywriter to, to test that for us before we put it into place. Um, that copywriter is now so good at what they do, um, I can't afford them, um, so I'm glad I knew them back in the day because uh, nowadays they don't work for money. They won't. They won't ever. You can't pay them. Um, they only work for a share of the revenue. They're that good, um, and pretty much all the copy they write is now seven figures worth of revenue, and they take a share of that. So it's a really, really powerful script. Um, and at that point, then you've been offered the job, you've accepted the job, you've got a start date, and so uh, the seventh step is what we call minor risks. What happens if the hiring manager leaves? What happens if you know, they, their strategic goals change or their, their budget changes or some other crap that's beyond your control gets in the way of you starting the job. Yeah, you know, you've been offered it, you've accepted it, you've got a start date, and then the wheels come off the wagon. It happens, right? It doesn't happen every single time you change jobs, which is why we call it minor risks, but it'll happen once and it stings like a bitch when it happens because, you know, you've been for interviews where, you know, you didn't get the job. You're like, well, I'm, I'm sanguine about that. It wasn't ideal anyway. I'm not bothered. It's not going to be like that this time. This is going to be your ideal job at your preferred company for serious money. You don't get that. That's going to hurt. All right. So even though you've been offered the job and have accepted the job and have a start date, we still go looking for trouble just to make sure it doesn't slip through your fingers. And that seven step program is definitive. You follow the steps, you will get a result. All right. Uh, and I've, I've hung our entire operating revenue on the back of that. Because if you don't, um, you get all your money back. And obviously, I'm not working for nothing. I'm not that stupid. Um, it works. Right. So there you go. There's the seven steps. I don't know whether that's a teaser or just basically you've got the whole lot there. Um, Michael saying, what about the gig work? They're looking for part-time or contract work. Contract work, no problem, Michael. I've handled the careers um, of interims or senior contractors, typically on $1,000 a day or more. A lot of you are in that space. Um, it's exactly the same. All right. It's the exact same. You want to get found for what you want to get found for. You want to get found faster. So the gaps between contracts aren't long because um, that can save you quite a lot of money. If you're on $1,000 a day or more, and you're off one month extra, that's 20 working days, that's $20,000 a year extra you can earn just by not having a gap or an unnecessarily long gap, all right? And if you're getting paid 1250 next time around rather than 1000 again, um, then suddenly the numbers really start to stack up, all right? Uh, so I've got some stuff and then I'm gonna run. Um, so I'm gonna share some links. So I'm gonna put those in there now. Uh, yeah, they all are, let's just bang those in there. So uh, there's four links. Um, first thing is a diary note for you. Um, is the 23rd of September. Um, I'm going to run uh, a LinkedIn um, optimization masterclass. All right, this is completely, all of these things are completely free. All right, there's no charge for any of this. So the LinkedIn optimization masterclass, it's going to be live, it'll be on Zoom, it'll be interactive. Um, and I'll take you through all the elements that you're required to optimize your LinkedIn profile. I also have a $550 LinkedIn optimization program, which somebody's going to win. All right, I'm just going to draw somebody out of the hat and give it to them on the day. All right. Uh, and so that's going to happen um, uh, on the 23rd. 
And then the following week, uh, on Monday the 27th, I start a five-day executive job seeking accelerator. Uh, Leora's been on it, so she can tell you what that's like. Um, but those things are exceptionally powerful, even though they're free. Um, but it takes you through the first two of the seven steps of the um, program that I run. So you get a clear idea about you know, how valuable and powerful it is. And that is basically me you know, showing you a little bit of the program um, to give you a reason to buy the rest. Right? I'm not going to duck what the reason why I do that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's how I make my living. I show you how good it is, and then I leave it to you to decide whether to buy or not. So there's no sales pitch on that, but it is a, almost like a try before you buy. Yeah. Um, so you get that on the LinkedIn masterclass on the 23rd, and then the five day accelerator on the 27th. It's not five full days. It's literally you know five minutes to half an hour a day, depending on the day. Plus, I do some evening um, sessions where I get a cup of tea and I talk for about an hour and just help everybody out. Um, there's also an ebook on there, seven steps to six figures. Um, that's about 30 odd pages of pure gold, um, a lot more detail in there um, from the program. There's no fluff in there. That's just chapter after chapter after chapter on all the aspects. So you can get that and get a bit more detail and also run a free group on Facebook. All right. Um, uh, so let's just have a look here. I've got a message here. Ah, I've got some captions going on. That's fine. Um, so there's a free group on Facebook. There are hundreds and hundreds of executive job seekers in there um, and we give away tons of value in there. Uh, and of course, from time to time, when I've got a masterclass happening or I've got a five day accelerator on, um, which doesn't happen very frequently, but from time to time, we get something. Um, and that's how you get alerted to that stuff. So that, that's all free, free group, free ebook, um, free uh, LinkedIn masterclass, which you might also win the, the program for, and um, a five day accelerator. So there you go. Bunch of stuff. Help yourselves to that. Um, Laura saying the accelerator program is excellent. It doesn't take much of your time. You get personalized attention and feedback and you get to see your true value, not to be missed. Um, yeah, if anybody wants their elevator pitch punched up, um, that, that five days there, um, you'll have it done. You know, first few steps of the program, positioning and messaging done by Friday. Right. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, stuff? We're gonna be here for another eight minutes max and then I've got to run. So if you've got a question, now's the time to ask it because in nine minutes time, you'll regret it because I won't be here. Uh just a point of view that uh, uh, Joyce of the Fang had mentioned uh, uh, that she was going to send out uh, the transcript of of uh, today's the recording of today's meeting, yep. as well as well as uh, I think many, if not all, of the freebies that you just alluded to, uh, Johnny, yeah. uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so, um, and uh, the other the other point that I wanted to stress is you have a website that uh, we can go to uh, uh, at our leisure and learn more about what it is that you offer. As it happens, I do. I didn't have one last time somebody asked me that question. My team have literally just built it. It's quite big because there's a bunch of other stuff I do, but um, it's just my name, johnnymwalker.com, J-O-H-N-N-Y. Um, let's see if I can open that up and... Um... So, yeah, okay. So if I go there, let's go back into chat and then to everybody, bang, bang, there you go. Uh, that link is now in there. Um, and so you can have a little talk, look, look at, you know, you know, th there's all sorts of th other things I do. I help out military personnel transition from, you know, officers, this is transitioning to civilian lives. Um, I help out a lot of management or MBA graduates um, who have spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on MBA and still out of work. Um, you know, we step in and fix those problems. So there's a bunch of other stuff on my website, which may not all be relevant to you. Um, you know, it's, it's quite a quite a business I run. Um, but for you guys, rather than maybe wade through that website, although you're more than welcome to, is um, just join the accelerator on the on the 27th. Um, they're, 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 they're high value, they're, they're high energy. Um, and it's just me and you guys, it's a closed group. So I can have a lot of fun. I can speak um, a little bit more openly than I can do in some of the public forums because uh, some of the language I use when I'm talking about recruiters and CV writers can get a little bit fruity. Um, so uh, they're always quite engaging. Um, uh, so yeah, just, but there you go. You, you'll get to learn a bit more about me just by coming on that and hanging out with me for five days and I'll help you all out. Whether you choose then to continue to work with me or not um, afterwards is entirely up to you. You're all grown adults, so I'll treat you like that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that's in the chat box here. Uh, great insights, says Michael. You're welcome, Michael. I'm pleased to have been of help to you. Uh, and we'll be on your workshops. Good. I'm going to look forward to seeing you. Um, 
David says, thanks very much. The insights you shared are spot on, practical and useful. I try, David, I try. Um, uh, the, the one thing, David, when you give a 100% money back guarantee, you've got to know your shit, right? <laughs> so uh, fingers crossed. Um, and uh, John says, can they send the chat as you can't save it on the phone with your links? I'm sure somebody will save that file for you, um, John. Uh, Ronald saying, thank you, John. You're welcome, uh, Ronald. Um, uh, if you've got any specific questions about stuff that's going on right now, I'll see if I can fix it for you immediately. I've got an interview coming up, Johnny, or Johnny, I'm just doing my CV and I'm not certain about this or that ever or whatever, you know. I dare someone to ask me how long a CV should be. Um, Hi, Johnny. It's Leora. I do have a question. Welcome again. What happens if you get a gig that's lucrative enough for you to take, but it's really not in your field in between? Is it worth taking or will it really throw you off when you try to get your new job because you have to list it on your CV? Um, it depends on how a sort of out of your field of specialism it is. Um, the, the thing I would ask then, you know, is it so proud of your specialism that you can actually do the job with any kind of credibility? You know, are you being hired to do something that, you know, you're really just making it up as you go along? If not, then it, it shouldn't be that far aligned. You know, so it's unusual for someone to be so diverse that, you know, you're, you know, um, head of investment management operations and also a circus juggler. You know what I mean? They're just, those two things are better whack, but it's unusual for someone to be that. So um, if it's, you know, not, not wildly misaligned, um, it's just a, a thing that's not in your sweet spot, then I'm, I'm happy with you doing a job, earning some money and taking the pressure off you. But if it's a leap, like, you know, yesterday I was an astronaut, tomorrow I'm a checkout cashier. Yeah, maybe think, rethink that one. You know, there, there, is, there is potential career damage there. It depends on how wacky you're talking. I mean, what, what is the, can you give me a practical example? Um, I can't really think of one, but something that <laughs> you would be earning less than what you normally would, but it's just lucrative enough to keep you going. Uh, and a lot of people yeah, are suggesting um, these things. And I know I've been saying no to them because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so a job that's slightly more junior. Yeah. Uh, should you do it? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the uh, And I say that I have slightly rose tinted spectacles on in the sense that our program um, absolutely mitigates the risk of that. And I've had several people say, look, I've got this job offer. It takes the pressure off me. Should I do it? And I'm like, yeah, sure because you're gonna get found for your ideal job. If you're not on this program and you do that, there is a risk there that you'll end up going backwards in your career temporarily. Um, and only you can decide for yourselves whether that is financially worthwhile for you. Some of you are under quite a lot of financial pressure, in which case needs must. Um, and I'm not gonna be a snob about it. Money in the bank doesn't care where it came from, all right? You know, what, it, so you gotta do it um, sometimes, all right? And I'm not, I'm not gonna sweat that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Jane says, how long should a CV be? <laughs> Uh, as long as it's relevant, I don't care. And neither does a hiring manager. They all say, what about this two-page CV, Johnny? I'm like, do you know why it's two pages? You know, what, you know where that myth came from? Hiring managers and HR people who had to read CVs for their jobs. Most of your CVs are absolutely shit, all right? No one wants to read long CVs that are absolute garbage. Um, so as they can't get you to make them better, the easy thing to do is just get you to make them shorter. Short shit is better than long shit. However, um, uh, if you can make it highly relevant, um, then a three, four page CV is no problem. All right. And, and we've certainly fixed that on the program. And uh, very rare for someone with extensive careers like you to get it onto two pages and not miss out chunks that are relevant. Um, but you've just got to make sure it's not dull and, 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 and padded with crap that the hiring manager is not interested in. Say, I mean, none of us have problems wading through a 300 page John Christian book, do we? It's not the length of what you're reading. It's the problem. It's the quality of it. All right. Um, there are books we pick up and go, nah, that's boring. And you just bail. All right. And that's the same with your CV. It's not about the length. It's about the quality. All right. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, some people are telling me only list details the last 10 years and then just name a few companies under other expenses and no details. But I've been working for 35 years. Yeah. And again, it's relevancy. Um, uh, who said that? Jane. So I, I you know, for, for some people, it'll be 10 years. Some people, it's 15. For the first 10 years of my career, I was in wealth management. You know what? No one who works with me nowadays cares. I boiled the first 10 years of my career down to literally a paragraph, but that's because it was relevancy. It wasn't about an amount of time. Yeah. So I think, you know, again, use a qualitative metric rather than a quantitative one. All right. Uh, Shelley, who's also the co-chair of Indianapolis fame. Johnny, this has been an awesome presentation with very valuable information. I'm looking forward to the 23rd and the 27th, and I'd really like to discuss the possibility of you, and I'm thinking that says, uh, probably coming and talking with Indianapolis. Um, Shelley, no problem at all. Um, in fact, let me put an email address here. Help me at 
the exec edge dot whoops. Um, uh, anybody, um, as well as Shelley, if anybody needs me, um, use that email address, all right? Because I don't actually read my own emails anymore. I have far too many of them. Um, there's a lady called Alina who looks out to my office for me and she'll triage all the emails and all the important stuff like Feng um, gets my attention. Everybody else gets you know dealt with in an appropriate way. I won't explain what happens to those emails. Um, uh, Lynn's got a dash, no problem. Uh, me too, actually, Lynn, on that note. Uh, Jane says, thank you very much. You're welcome, yeah. Think about relevancy. Think about, think about the hiring manager, all right? If they've got four pages and it's pure gold, do you think they're going to rule you out because it's more than two pages long? And if they've got something that's two pages, but it's just complete shit, do you think they're just going to be grateful they didn't have to read a third page of it? It's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. Um, uh, future presentation of your group. Yeah, absolutely, Shelley. Use the email address there. Um, Alina runs my diary. She'll book you straight in. No need to speak to me about that. Um, and uh, if anybody wants me to talk to them, to, to any group about anything, actually, uh, related to job seeking, CVs, uh, LinkedIn, interviews, doesn't have to be about the program I run. I'm, I'm there to help people out. That's what I do for a living, all right? So um, it doesn't have to be about, oh, I've got a thing coming up. Let's go and market that. It's, a, it's you know, I'm just I'm just there for senior job seekers, all right? So just drag me in to help you guys out. No, Johnny, it was great meeting you, says Neil. I look forward to staying in touch. Fantastic presentation. You're welcome, Neil. All right, that's it, guys. Um, I want to say thank you to Jerry for bringing me in. Oh, it's our pleasure. Uh, uh, for... Um... Uh, just another piece of information is that uh, I heard from the uh, chair of the St. Louis chapter, yeah. uh, and uh, you are going to be there, I believe, on the 22nd of this month. Uh, so if uh, any of the attendees tonight want uh, another dose of Johnny, uh, uh, there's an opportunity there. And uh, I think you're very refreshing, and uh, I think you give great, great content uh i look forward to uh having you appear before us uh sometime in the future again okay, grab another subject um i'm at nashville on the 21st and I'm at st louis on the 22nd and I'm, I'm on la talk radio this evening um so i mean i'm gonna be around guys uh i think it's oh, called yeah. la talk radio but i suspect it actually it's going to new york because of the time of day we're doing it it's an odd title for a show that's on the east coast that's i don't know why would you give a west coast why would you give an east coast radio show a west coast name that's something I don't understand there. <laughs> LA Talk Radio from New York. <laughs> Somebody's not quite got the marketing of that right in my head, but there. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be rolling around the East Coast of uh, the US pretty much for the rest of the year. Um, you know, just, just grab me and, and, and give me the help out and stuff. Yeah. <coughs> That's it, guys. I'm going to have to run. Um, thank you to Matt for being my glamorous assistant earlier. And thank you to thank Leora you for, uh, um, for being a great speaker to, to Fan Chicago, Johnny. Uh, I love it, guys. Um, and it's not 10 o'clock at night. Woo! Okay. I, 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 can do, I can do my Johnny Walker now. Yeah, yes. yeah. Great session, yes, we kept him late in New York. Thank you again, Johnny. And if anybody needs Johnny in any of the other chapters, just contact Joyce Gibney. She'll help you arrange everything. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a bunch of um, guys and things. Uh, and we've had loads of things people come through the program. So you will not be the first by a long stretch of the imagination if you choose to use me after the um, accelerator. I'll be, you know, You'll be, you'll be treading a well-worn path there as senior finance people that we've helped out. Cool. Yes. That's it. Got to run. Thank you, Johnny.